breakaway, showtime, he scores! We all grew up with the same dream, and that's one day to lift the Stanley Cup. We all have that same dream. It's always been, always been my dream. Even, even today, I still dream about it. I don't think a, a guy who hasn't won a Stanley Cup doesn't sit there and, 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 and think about lifting that cup over their head. I've always said that the Stanley Cup to me is a holy grail. You spend your whole life dreaming of maybe playing for the Stanley Cup and winning it. It's the ultimate. It's, what, it's why we play. And, you know, first of all, you want to make it to the NHL. And second of all, you know, you want to win the Stanley Cup. You're almost leery of touching it. It's there, and you're sitting in the dressing room afterwards, and you, it's the greatest sense relief, and you're looking at things saying, that thing's actually in the middle of our dressing room. That's what Gordy Howe went after. That's what Jean Beliveau went after. I'm going to get my picture taken with that. I'm going to be able to take my picture home, put it up in my mantle, and whether nobody else ever sees it, I will be able to see my picture with Lord Stanley. Stanley Cup. The original Stanley Cup cost $48.67 in 1892. They spend millions of dollars now trying to get their names inscribed on it. Let's turn it up, listen, and look at the sound of a Stanley Cup champion. When Lord Stanley of Preston donated the Dominion Challenge Cup in 1892, he could not possibly have imagined his impact on the world of sports. 107 years later, his trophy, which has evolved into the Stanley Cup, has become the most recognizable trophy in the world. But it is far more than simply the ultimate prize in the game of hockey. In the past century, the Stanley Cup has become the game's greatest ambassador. It has touched the lives of pedestrians and presidents, stood at the center of the wildest celebrations, and been revered all over the world. On the ice, the right to hoist the Stanley Cup has been the subject of some of sport's fiercest battles. For when the cup is within sight, these athletes become capable of some show-stopping performances. McCarty makes the move, gets in, don't oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. He makes a goal! Down at McCarty! The fucking star! Forsberg looking credit into the goal! Near side, Forsberg shot, star! Oh, is he red hot? A second the shot, deflected wide by Forsberg. He scores! A German track! Yager, nice move around Brent Sutter to the backhand. Let's it go, he scores! Cuts in, still with the puck. Nice pass to Zubal. Zubal, feeds Link. Link scores! Anderson made a big play. He scores! Anderson on a big play. For a minute, here's Niedermeyer. He can fly. Niedermeyer reached in the trailer. Niedermeyer just missed. Niedermeyer scores! Scott Niedermeyer! Gretzky is up there. Gretzky scores! Wayne Gretzky! He scores! Oh, oh, oh. Alexei Kovalov! Penalty back to the players. Recky was knocked down. The view dances and it scores! It was Neil Messier. Scoop, Miss Thompson. The rebound. Miss Thompson. Another shot. Miss Thompson. You heard him before. Great save by Smith. Here comes Corey against Mike Richter. Saved by Richter! A oh. penalty shot for Pavel Murray and Richter has held the board. Important the game, the bigger Patrick Waugh plays. What can you say about Patrick Waugh? If Canadians win this game tonight, you're looking at the Con Smythe Trophy winner. Heads up! Get out of the way, What a hit! <laughs> and the body check of the playoffs. That's the end, beautiful! Behind the net 
the center, and Orr! Bobby Orr! Orr from the Boston Bruins! The Bruins are standing up! And Kessler and Charlie Lee being about 25, they score! Here's the chance for the clear! Oh, and then Orr by the open side! He got another crack at it! He scores! The Canadians win the game in overtime! Again! Shot! He scores! He is an amazing man. Every year when a champion is crowned, it means that new stories are written and new heroes are born. But in two seasons, the Detroit Red Wings have added stories to the Cup's lore that may never be forgotten. Detroit's identity as hockey town was cemented in the 1950s when the Red Wings captured four titles in six years. But that legacy slipped to distant memories as four decades of disappointment were heightened by the frustration of the mid-90s. But in 1997, that would change. There was a very quiet hunger um, that kept building throughout the playoffs. I think you really saw our team you know, pour it all on. Vindicating themselves against the avalanche, the Red Wings set their sights on hockey's ultimate prize. Hey, this is good tough hockey. Philly was made brutally aware of Detroit's passion. We've won the Stanley Cup. We've got a summer to enjoy it and start all over again. Let's make this the greatest summer of our lives. But the celebration was tragically halted. We're just getting ready to uh, to take the Stanley Cup ar around town, and uh, we got that tragic phone call. Vladimir Konstantinov, the Stanley Cup champion, Detroit Red Wings, is in serious condition. Everybody was such on such a high and feeling so good about themselves, and then uh, all this happens. It felt like he just wanted to give that cup back and just have uh, Vlad and Sergey come back. Expected each morning to wake up and that you were going to read in the paper that uh, they were released from the hospital and everything was going to be normal. And day after day it kept going and you realize that you know, things aren't going to get to normal for maybe forever or for a long time. They're the defending champions. Everything seems loaded for Detroit except for one unreasonable doubt, no matter how unfair. Facing unique adversity, Detroit once again returned to the playoffs where they were greeted by some old friends. The closeness between the guys, uh, sometimes uh, the word family is sort of used with loose lips, but that's exactly what we are. Game one is underway. A return to the finals was a tribute to the team's courage, but they wanted more. Keep putting that pressure, boys, come on. After dropping the opener, Washington was determined to rebound in game two. Bouncing shot, boys. But the hardened Red Wings were not. Mounting a late comeback, Doug Brown sent the contest into overtime. Chris Draper would complete the drama. The incredible comeback is complete! Up two games to none, Detroit looked to repeat the sweep. Detroit looking up, staying onside. Fedorov shot, he scores! This is Fedorov. I found the uh, most touching moment maybe when there's 15 minutes to go in the third period and there was, I think, a whistle and all of a sudden there was a lot of noise and you could see everybody looking up behind the Washington net. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, my. Vladimir Konstantinov, his wife, Irina. Unbelievable. And even the Washington fans put their hands together. And boy, oh, boy, it doesn't get any better than that.
you know, our whole bench stood up and guys are banging on the board and stuff. And this is like 15 minutes ago in the third period of, uh, you know, game four. You know, Bob, you have to play 40 games during the season or one during the finals to get your name on the cup. Surely to God, they'll put this guy's on. When we win the game, game four, and they have a Stanley Cup, it's going to be an emotional, emotional moment because last, last year, when they won the cup, they didn't have a time to enjoy it. And it would be nice for them to have that kind of uh, glory moment to share with us. And uh, once again, to see their uh, faces smiling and, uh, and to see them happy. And Bencha, Osgood with his arms up over his head coming out. The Detroit Red Wings have won the Stanley Cup for the second year in a row. special moment, something you don't really see. I mean, it's almost like a movie script, really. Just an amazing display of human perseverance from training camp all the way through. And Vladimir Konstantinov will make the initial lap around the ice here at the MCI Center. I mean, this is just incredible. And they gave it to Ozzy right away. Tell the world, baby. Tell the world. Yes! Time to get this baby going. These Red Wings are the envy of hockey players all over the world, young and old. Everyone dreams of winning the cup. It's a dream almost as old as the game itself. And you can be sure that tomorrow's champions will have envisioned lifting Lord Stanley's Cup long before ever playing their first game in the NHL. Everybody who ever laced on a skate dreams of a day like this. I know most of the kids that I grew up with, their ambition was to be a hockey player. and. The and to win the Stanley Cup. That was the ultimate, ultimate thing in life. Well, you know, from the very first time I put on a pair of skates, I guess, in an open air rink, I was about five. And I started playing for the Stanley Cup then. I won the Stanley Cup on a daily basis. Every day that we played, at the end of the, end of the game, there was a time when we were carrying the Stanley Cup over top of our heads. I think for any kids, uh, when you see playoffs, uh, you're going on the street and play hockey, and and just dream to be this guy. I won it more times than I can shake a stick at. I won it, and I never played goal, ever. Always, uh, always scored the game-winning goal. Always was first star, second star, and third star. I can relate to uh, being eight, nine years old on the street, simulating the seventh game, overtime, Stanley Cup. Boom, boom, Jeffrey on the breakaway. Shoots and scores! And wins the Stanley Cup. Well, every player that's ever played has won this cup in the arena of his mind, in the backyard, or in the streets. And even though we were playing on roller skates most of the time, you know, you just dreamed of, you know, skating around with that Stanley Cup. Maybe we had a trash can over our head or, or something like that. When I was a kid, we had this silver ashtray that was probably three feet high. I mean, that was the Stanley Cup in our house. We used to play in our basement, basement hockey with little sticks and 
eight balls, and my cousins and brothers and I would go down there and we'd have tournaments, and my brother would make a cup, and uh, we'd advance to the cup, and we'd, when we'd win, you know, it was a bragging rights, and it was exciting to us, it was intense. I've been to the parades in Edmonton. It, it's just uh, amazing, because they're just idols, and they're just heroes, and uh, as a kid, you know, you want to be one of them. And, um, to see the, the Stanley Cup, the streets, I, I'll never forget. When I was growing up, there was Peter Stastny, a couple other guys who, uh, who defected, who had to defect, not knowing if ever they're going to come back uh, for, for one reason, to play in the NHL and win the Stanley Cup. And uh, you started thinking, oh, it must be something very cool. Always been my, my dream, you know, growing up watching the Bruins. Um, even, even today, I still dream about it. I don't think a, a guy who hasn't won a Stanley Cup doesn't sit there and, 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 and think about lifting that cup over their head. We've all won it in our imagination, have we not? a select few get a chance to really win it. Lifting the cup is what it's all about. You've trained, you've sweat, you've sacrificed, and it's all worth it when the final buzzer sounds. But not every NHL great is shared in such joy. There are others who've sacrificed just as much and trained just as long and never shared the thrill of hoisting the Stanley Cup. I know how it feels when you lose. It feels like when you wake up the next morning, you put so much into it, it feels like there's been a death in the family. How much worse could it ever get than that day? That was the worst day of my life. One of the greatest tragedies of his life sometimes dies in a man while he lives. And the Capitals stand there, exhausted, with their heads hanging low. Uh, obviously, you've missed something because you didn't achieve your ultimate goal. ultimately lost to the Islanders, seeing their joy and our disappointment, and I was wondering if I'd ever get there again. And Extol now has the look in his eye of someone who hates terribly to lose. There's going to be a lot of great players go through their careers and, and never have the opportunity to get their name on the cup. Some of the failed quests have been so painful that they too have become legend. That's a tough one to lose. What a show. One team that seemed destined to win a cup was the New York Rangers in the early 70s. Their star-laden lineup made them the darlings of New York sports fans, and Emile Francis guided them into the 72 finals. But New York's garden party was spoiled by Bruins superstar Bobby Orr. We're playing the sixth game, the score is nothing, nothing. There's about three minutes to go in the second period. The puck comes out to Bobby Orr. Orr made a move that only Bobby Orr could make. He threw the puck to the inside of the rink and pulled it back and took a stepper on and fired the puck and beat Villamir on the glove side. That was the game. It's probably one of the most painful experiences of my life. In Madison Square Garden, the sixth game, for them parading this thing, this huge trophy, like around our home, you know, in our home. So it was very painful. 22 years later, New York finally got to celebrate its championship. But like all Stanley Cup battles, there were emotional casualties. When you go to the seventh game and you're laying in your bed that afternoon thinking about, you know, you're 60 minutes away from carrying the Stanley Cup around Madison Square Garden, it's, you're that close and, and to fail, um, you know, it, it took a while to get over that. Even the powerful Oilers were not immune to heartache. One of the cruelest episodes in hockey history occurred in 1986, when a rookie made such a colossal Game 7 blunder that it derailed a dynasty. Steve Smith won't soon forget his 23rd birthday. Oh, they score! Oh, Steve Smith in attempting to get it out of his own zone, put it in the net! Well, will Steve Smith be the GOAT? the Spike Division Final. And Steve Smith showing all the emotion of that horrendous miscue that cost them the winning goal. I mean, how, how much worse could it ever get than that day? That was the worst day of my life, and it'll, ne it'll never change. And I learned a lot about that organization. They stuck by me. They allowed me to, uh, to fulfill a lot of dreams. After 13 months of living hell, Smith got his reprieve. With one noble gesture, hockey's great one mended a broken heart. It was a shock to me. And he took it from the president of the league then, John Ziegler, and said, Smitty, take it and go. Look at this picture. Steve Smith, a year ago, I don't have to remind you of what happened in the seventh game against Calgary. 
gets a chance to raise it. It was just elation. It was a great feeling to be able to turn. My parents were in the stands, look at them, and, and show them the cup. Steve Smith's 13-month odyssey may be one of hockey's most poignant moments, but it's one of many stories that illustrate the passion of the Stanley Cup playoffs. But players and coaches aren't the only people to get cup crazy. Off the ice, the fires burn just as bright when the Stanley Cup is on the line. In the world's fastest game, an atmosphere of enthusiasm, bedlam, and excitement. And the reason for it all, the Stanley Cup. And this is what I've been waiting for 34 years. I got my wife, my kids are here. We're gonna have a ball, baby, and we're gonna kill the octopus. Some of Hollywood's biggest and brightest have gotten into the act. When I got interested in the sport, it was when the uh, Kings went to the Stanley Cup Finals with Montreal, and I realized that it's like it's, it's ballet and, and brute strength. Access denied. Hey, Stanley Cup playoff time again. You know what we got? We got lift shots, snap shots, slap shots. You name it, we got it. It's the greatest game in the world, boy. Those guys dancing all around, checking into the board, checking this way, checking that way. Bang, boom, bang, Stanley Cup, yay! Bobby Orr, when uh, we won the Cup in 69-70 and that famous shot of him tripped uh, after he scored the goal and flying through the air was the thing that we would always try to recreate, even on concrete when we played street hockey. We play street hockey and you know as you're running in you're like two seconds left for the Stanley Cup. Score! And yeah we do our little victory laps with the cup over our head. And I grew up a, a Ranger fan so there was an awful long drought. The cup didn't come here this city for a long time. My fondest memories uh, were seeing game seven and uh, seeing them win for the first time in my life. Not only that but that night I went in search of the cup and I found the cup. Me and my friend got in a cab and said take us to the cup. Did you drink from the cup? Yeah. How awesome was that? It was unbelievable. One, two, three, four. Academy Award winner Tom Hanks. And you gotta get cup crazy. Ooh, please phrase your response in the form of a question. You'd have to be clueless not to be cup crazy. As if. No, sorry, I'm afraid the correct response is what is cup crazy? NHL's the coolest game on earth. I'm good on a quack. If you're going to do a movie, a hockey movie, and you could cast yourself to play any part, and the storyline could be anything, what would it be? I'd hoist the cup over my head. This is the Stanley Cup, awarded to the greatest team in the coolest game on earth. Can I keep this?
The tradition of the Cup extends far beyond the wins and the losses. After the last game has been played, after the victors have celebrated and the vanquished have cried, a special journey begins that will take the Cup and a few select men the entire summer to complete. I think one of the neat things about the Stanley Cup is obviously it's off-season uh, travels. Each player gets it for a 24-hour period, and, and that 24 hours is used right up to the second in most cases. We have to stay up quite a bit, like, you know, your night is done when they're done, and that could be one in the morning, that could be six in the morning. You're in the public and you have to, you have to answer the first question of the day like you would answer the last question of the day. Your job is honor and integrity, and you got to maintain that. I take my job very seriously. I take the tradition of the cup very seriously. Like you take it to hospitals, and we've both done it, where you put it in the lap of a kid who, who just broke his leg or has been paralyzed, and to see the kid, like they're, they're almost crying, you know? Like I had a, a lady in a wheelchair. She was 86 years old, and she's telling me, one of the things I wanted to do before I die is to touch the Stanley Cup. And she showed no emotion on her face, but you could see the tears rolling down, and I'm like, like how do you not get moved by that, you know? I have some very special days. Uh, being able to travel to Sweden for eight days was tremendous. Um, we had a, a very good time with uh, Anders Ericsson at his party. Probably the most fun I think though I had was the two days I spent with Joey Coaster. He took the cup home to his home in Kelvington, Saskatchewan. That's a town of about 900 people and his civic rally drew about 3,000 people. Wow. People came from buses of four or five hours away to come see the Stanley Cup. And then the rest of the time we hung out at his farm by the campfire and sang songs. Here's Simon, he has two loves in life. One of it's uh, fishing and one of it's hockey. So he combined them both. He was fortunate to win the cup. We took it out in a boat into Wawa Lake and we fished for four hours and he was just in heaven, sitting with the cup beside him with the fish out in the water. Unfortunately for Chris though, he didn't catch anything that day. It travels now not only Canada and U.S., but obviously there's Europeans in the National Hockey League, so it goes over to Europe and throughout the summer the cup sees some really neat things. And I think in Moscow we underestimate what People around the world think of the Stanley Cup in it sometimes because they were thrilled to see it, to have Fedosov and pass it around to some of the people to actually, so they could touch it. That's a real one. That was something probably in a lifetime when we might not ever see again, to see the Cup overseas and into Russia and into Moscow. I've always believed it's about the luxury of having your fingerprints and your name on that trophy, but I think it's more about the sweet feeling you have when you hoist the cup overhead and you know that you're in for the most beautiful and endless summer of your entire life. We, we live in Wyoming in the summertime, Jackson Hole, and we had a hockey school there and the travel schedule for the cup worked out that we had it there. I had all those kids taking the pictures with it and most of them couldn't believe it. They, now it's four years later, they show me the pictures and they said, I still cannot believe it. I touched the uh, names, we engraved the greatest players of the game. After uh, we won the cup, we did uh, party uh, long and hard uh, with it being there all the time and it was great uh, to wake up the next morning and we had set the cup at the end of the bed and you know when you wake up in the morning you look up and ah oh, geez there's Lord Stanley right there that was that was the greatest. I just ended up taking it to my house in Calgary I got some pretty cool pictures I had it in bed with me and sleeping and, and uh, I was riding it like a horse with I had a bunch of cowboy gear on and stuff. Joey was promised years ago uh, when he won the first cup that uh, he could bring it down to the neighborhood, but because of scheduling, uh, he never got the chance. To bring that Stanley Cup into that playground and, and see the guys skate around with it, it was really special. We had a uh, big street hockey game for the cup. You know, I had uh, divided my friends, you know, equally, and we said, let's play for the cup. And uh, it's too bad to say, but I lost it. So my boys were walking around with their, the Stanley Cup over the head all the way through through the streets, people were stopping with their cars. What are they, these guys doing with the cup, you know? We made several trips with that Stanley Cup to hospitals. And just to, to bring it to as many people as you could, to let them touch it, to let them feel part of it. I mean, he he had it one time right outside of his, his uh, condominium or his brownstone or whatever in New York, just on the street, and he was sitting on the steps, and people would just walk by, and it was absolutely incredible. They were just like, this just doesn't happen in pro sports. In the summertime, Steve Eisner was going to have a little bit of a party in Michigan, and uh, 
I said, gee, I'm in, I'm in Ottawa at the same time, and, and my family and everybody, we, we can't get up there the day that you got the cup. And he calls back and he says, you know, if you can't make the Stanley Cup party, the Stanley Cup party's coming to you guys. So we have a great time. Everybody drinks out of the cup. Next morning he calls me and says, you want to, uh, you want to, go, to the, go to the hospital? Let's go to the hospital. He says, well, got the Stanley Cup. Let's go to the hospital and visit some kids. And that's very typical of Steve. Spent four hours at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa going from floor to floor with the Stanley Cup and cheering up children's days and some of them may not see tomorrow. And it was a pretty unique experience. Dynasty. It's a word that can be used to describe few teams in the history of the game. The men who were part of a hockey dynasty are members of a select club. As players, they brought with them a drive, a determination, sometimes even a swagger that drove their teams towards greatness and a special place in the lore of the Stanley Cup. Montreal wins the game 4-0 and the series four straight. Most fans agree this is the finest hockey team ever assembled. Third consecutive Stanley Cup. No American team has ever done it. Edmonton Oilers have won it again. Get from a city and I just can't take the wall. Paul Cole, hit it from the front door. I'm like a rebel in a renegade living in the underground. Anybody will ever beat the record, but I know it'll at least take him five years. Who's going to be the hero in here? And, you know, the chorus would go around the room. I'm going to be the hero. I'm going to be the hero. They knew that they were going to win. And therefore, they never thought any other way. We felt like that was ours, and we wanted to have that back. Yeah, they knew that they were the best team. What an awesome machine this Edmonton Oilers team is. Anybody can put up regular season numbers. Your whole life is on the line in the playoffs. If we played to the best of our ability, we would not lose. We were on a mission. You know, we were on a mission to win again. Beautiful! The combination of offense and defense beyond that of their peers. But perhaps most importantly, they had money players. In the history of the game, there have been a select few with the unique ability to be at their best when it mattered most. Goaltending is the biggest factor in the playoffs, and the NHL has a long history of money goalies. Billy Smith's clutch play led the Isles to four straight cups, including a sweep of the Oilers in 83. Great save by Smith. Curry in the back of the net. Smith thought at the last minute. His fourth cup was the sweetest, but the Islanders' dynasty was snuffed out by those same Oilers one year later. Grant Fuhrer's acrobatics led the way. What a stop by Fuhrer! Like Smith, he too won four cups in the 80s. The Over the line, shifting in. Oh, Fuhrer robbed him! Eklund centers, Smith a shot, saved by Fuhrer. Cross for the drive, saved by Fuhrer. This is playoff hockey. Grant Fuhrer becoming the best, if not the best, money goaltender in the game today. One of the best money goalies in the 70s was Bernie Perrant. In 1974, he carried the Flyers to their first championship. He shoots big six days. Or tees it up, fires high, stop, just save. And then Perrant grabs that. Philadelphia repeated, and Perrant became the only goalie ever to win MVPs back-to-back. -back. Perrant is absolutely fantastic. In the 50s and 60s, if you needed a shutout, you turned to Terry Sawchuk. Sawchuk combined an unbelievable 103 shutouts and another 12 in the playoffs, winning four Stanley Cups in his 21-year career. Well, maybe the best money goaltender in the game today, in fact, is the best money goaltender when it comes to playoffs. In recent years, no one has made more clutch stops than Patrick Waugh. McSorley, great save by Waugh! Waugh's confidence boosted Colorado in their first year. Look out, Cleaver Krause off! Wide right open! Unbelievable save by Waugh! Patrick helped win the first Major League title in Denver, but he had help from another money player. Claude Lemieux demonstrated his ability to deliver in the clutch as a rookie. Claude won his second cup with New Jersey and cemented his reputation as a money man. The 
The antagonistic Essa Tikkanen has collected five Stanley Cups. When the money is on the line, when it's time to step up your game, as it is in the playoffs, that's when Tikkanen really shines. 44 seconds to go on the power play. Tikkanen in deep shoots. He scores! Overtime is tick time. He carried that winning attitude to New York. Tikkanen shoots, score, score! Essa Tikkanen does it again! He's a money player that seems to rise to the occasion in big games. Essa Tikkanen the move, Tikkanen back and score! The money players, the dynasties, the glorious victories, the bitter defeats, it's all here. Etched forever on sport's most revered trophy. But of everything it has experienced in the last century, what remains most vivid in our imaginations are the memories. Memories of the sacrifice, the blood, the sweat, and the tears that are still spilled every spring in search of one thing, the Stanley Cup. I remember Wayne Gretzky had said that, well, you have the regular season, you have the playoffs, and then there's the finals. Well, I knew what he meant after the finals were over. No! No! Tremendous physical sacrifice. Uh, there's no other sport that has a playoff that lasts two months. Let's go! The run of the playoffs is a grueling one mentally, physically, emotionally. Unbelievable. On yourself, on your family. Unbelievable, with every win, with every loss, with every play. You compare it to a marathon, but a marathon which requires a sprint from start to finish. You know, you just eat, sleep, drink, hockey. That's what you play for, and when you get there, you want to do anything to, uh, to win it. And uh, if it's playing through pain or uh, any kind of sacrifice, you'll do it. It's a really hard thing to explain what you go through. Uh, you know, you really have to go through it to know what it's like to play when you're injured. It's demanding, it's hard, it's difficult. There's not a player probably on the team who's 100%. <laughs> With the cup on the line, no sacrifice is too great. Very first shift of of the finals, Mark Messi just comes to take me out. Well, he, ends up, he needs me in the thigh. Well, by the, by the third period, I can't move. Our conditioning coach, he'd say like three times a day, he says, you're not leaving until your heel touches your rear end. He, <laughs> he put me through torture and pain. He had me crying every day. Oh, the playoffs are here. No doubt about it. We uh, recall Brent Gilchrist. He was getting needles, uh, as awful as it sounds, in the groin and we would hear him screaming before games and in between periods, and he was, you know, maybe four or five rooms over, and we could hear him screaming. And he played until, until the muscle just separated from his bone, and he couldn't play anymore. That's the size of the heart, not the size of the body. I know I had players, and one in particular, that he couldn't even walk. When I told him, you can't play, he refuses to know I'm playing. There's no way that I'm not playing out. I don't care. I've been working all my life for this, and I'm going to play. This is the Stanley Cup. You do what you have to do to win. Come on, we can't run here, guys. Now is the time of the year for these players to shine and to step up their game a level and to pay that ultimate price. You see guys living in tubs of ice. You see guys living in, in, the, in the whirlpool. You see guys living on the trainer's table saying to the trainer, listen, just get me through one more game. One more game with you. And the trainer's saying, I got to report this to the doctor. No, you don't have to report anything. You just do what you have to do. Get me ready to play. I'm playing. By the time you've traveled, all the miles you've traveled to get there and to take a shot at it, the biggest thing you don't want to do is you don't want to be left out in the final run at it. Win, lose, or draw, you don't want to be left out. It really takes everything that you have in your power to win, and I think that's why it's eluded a lot of players in their careers. For me, it's, it's the only thing I wanted to accomplish. I mean, I could give away all my goals for one chance at the Cup, and uh, it, it's just a great ride. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it.
I mean, I'd love to do that one more time. I would give anything for that. It's nothing like it, and you forget about all your injuries. You, you're very focused, and there's one thing you want, and that's the, that's the big cup. It really is magical. Whether you're 5 or 55, uh, it really doesn't matter. It, it's the experience of being around the cup, looking at the different names. So if there's anybody ever says that, I never came close to it, well, my name is on it. Might not be Marcel, it's Gilbert, but there's bloodline there, so we got one. <laughs> To the Hockey Hall of Fame and got my picture taken with the Stanley Cup and you know the very next uh, you know the next season I ended up uh, you know getting my name on it so it was, uh, it was kind of kind of ironic I guess.